But when we start working together, right, that's when you become strong. Salmon returned to the Yukon, but numbers are down. Racism is systemic. A new law hopes to address racism in Quebec's health network. I feel like through art, kids can express themselves in different ways. And a new show blends art and tradition. Welcome to APTN National News. I'm Leanne Sanders. As this year's Chinook salmon season comes to an end, the Car Cross Tagish First Nation in Yukon continues to grapple with the loss of the highly respected fish. As Sarah Connors tells us, solutions to help the salmon rebound can be found in traditional knowledge. Marsh Lake near Whitehorse was a place once rich with Chinook salmon. Decades ago, Tagish Kwan people gathered here to harvest a highly valued fish. While First Nations can no longer harvest in Marsh Lake, the importance of Chinook salmon lives on. There's this one young boy. He, um, he, they, they gave him a copper necklace. He had this copper necklace. And, For um, knowledge keeper and former Carcross Tagish First Nation Chief Mark Wedge, the, the story of Salmon Boy is a cautionary tale about what happens when salmon are not cherished. So they, they, they the story tells of a young boy who throws a world. And what my mother said is, is that you have to live your life like a salmon because they're constantly feeding the world. They're constantly giving to the world. They feed the people all over the world. They'll travel all over these oceans. Salmon numbers have dwindled over the years due to cumulative impacts of extreme environmental events and habitat loss. Most recent numbers gathered from sonar at the border of Alaska and the Yukon show around 15,000 Chinook. It's a slight increase from last year when 12,000 fish were counted, but still far below the 10-year historical average of 50,000 fish. At the Whitehorse Fish Ladder, just over 150 fish have been counted. And that's really, really sad. That's not good at all. Carcross Tagish Chief Mariah Benoit says her people now get their salmon from a neighboring community. Yeah, it's, it's going to be tough for their future. Yeah, I'm afraid for them that uh, they won't know what it's like. We have to take them other places to, to teach them how to preserve salmon. But Wedge says salmon are resilient and we should be preparing for their return. He says solutions can be found in indigenous teachings, ceremony and caring for the land and water. Is it redesigning fish ladders? Is it using traditional knowledge? You know, is it a combination of using spirituality and ceremony as well as science and technology to start figuring out how to bring those salmon home now? While places like Marsh Lake are without salmon for now, Wedge believes they will return as long as everyone does their part. But when we start working together, right, that's when you become strong. That's when, and that's the indication of when the animals say, okay, they're doing their part, let's do our part. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Marsh Lake. This week, the Nunavut government held a community-wide tuberculosis screening in Panyertung. It is one of three communities alongside Pond Inlet and now yet to be affected by an outbreak. Trevor Wright explains. This week, there is a community-wide tuberculosis screening in Panyertung, where there have been cases of TB since January 2021. An outbreak was declared in November that same year. It's not the only community to be impacted by the disease, but its outbreak is one of the largest, with 40 active and 187 latent cases in the community as of late August this year. The Nunavut government co-hosted it alongside Indigenous Services Canada and Nunavut Tungavik Incorporated. The screening should help Nunavut's Department of Health better see the extent of TB in the community. While our bad weather has delayed the delivery of some nursing staff to the community, its impact is expected to be limited with screening currently proceeded as planned. The process includes a questionnaire, skin test, chest x-ray and phlegm collection, as well as possible blood work. Tuberculosis disproportionately impacts Inuit and First Nations communities 
with food insecurity, overcrowded housing, smoking, and other illnesses contributing to the spread. Trevor Wright, APTN National News, Iqaluit. The Quebec government is currently consulting on Bill 32, legislation aimed at creating a cultural safety approach in that province's health network. But many are criticizing the government's failure to work with First Nations in drafting the law. Here is Maricela Amador with more. Sur ce, euh, dans le fond, nous quittons cette consultation et réitérons notre disponibilité à faire les choses autrement en tout respect. Bonne journée. Jennifer petit dufresne is the executive director of Joyce's principal office. She made the comment as she exited the public hearing on Bill 32 in Quebec's National Assembly this week. Nous avons déposé notre mémoire et nous vous laisserons en prendre connaissance. Vous pourrez constater dans le fond que le bureau du principe de Joyce ne cautionne pas les pratiques coloniales toujours présentes au sein du gouvernement du Québec. Just like Petuquet Dufresne, various groups have also denounced the law, among them Quebec's College of Physicians, who asked the government to acknowledge systemic racism in the health network. Notre mémoire compte 13 recommandations qui formulent comment le projet de loi pourrait aller plus loin dans ce premier pas. D'abord, la future loi doit être élaborée avec des Autochtones, pas à leur place. Autrement, c'est du colonialisme. They also recommended that other vulnerable communities be included in the bill. À la suite du décès tragique de Madame Echaquan, il y aura bientôt trois ans dans quelques jours, nous avons reconnu et dénoncé publiquement le racisme systémique dans le réseau de la santé et des services sociaux. Notre conseil d'administration a de plus pris une position sans équivoque en adhérant au principe de Joyce. However, Quebec's Indigenous Affairs Minister, Ian Lafreniere, pushed back on claims that the government did not consult with First Nations. I came here today, I made the tour of the 55 communities in Quebec, and we met 13 groups before we even thought to write a project of law. Gislaine Picard, the Chief of the Assembly of First Nations Quebec Labrador, boycotted the hearings to express his disapproval. The other element, and it's probably the most important aspect, is that for us, C'est important qu'il y ait une reconnaissance que nous formons des gouvernements. Et, et c'est quelque chose qui est totalement nié par euh, l'actuel gouvernement du Québec. Maricela Amador, APTN National News, Montréal. The Cree Nation government in Quebec has recently launched a registry to assess cabin damage caused by the devastating wildfires that swept that territory this summer. The registry aims to document the impact the fires had on Cree cultural infrastructure in affected areas. The centralized registry allows affected individuals to report damages online. The Cree Nation government said that this initiative is only the beginning and noted that the assessment will be done in phases. And this will allow for us to determine the level of economic impact on cultural activities. This information will also be used to create strategies on how we're going to replace uh, these items. It, you know, people have to understand that for us to practice traditional activities, you know, we're not just driving 10 minutes down the road. Some people have cabins that are sometimes up to 600 kilometers away from the community. We want to hear what you think on our stories tonight. Here's how to continue the conversation. To read and watch our stories, go to aptnnews.ca. If you have a story you want to share, send us an email to news at aptn.ca. You can find us online on your favorite social media sites, including TikTok, YouTube, LinkedIn, and X, previously known as Twitter. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest throws. Time for a quick break now, and when we come back, a profile of one of the Métis Nation of Alberta candidates vying for the top job. I think my years of, uh, of service to our community, I think that's really what, uh, what really makes me stand out when it comes to who the people need to uh, vote for this, this time around.
Welcome back. Voting began on Wednesday in the Métis Nation of Alberta general election. Voters have until September 19th to cast ballots for district representatives and to choose the new president. After 27 years in office, President Audrey Poitra is retiring. APTN's Chris Stewart spoke to Joseph Pimlot, who is running against Andrea Sandmeyer for the top job. On Monday, the two candidates for Métis Nation of Alberta president squared off in debate, moderated by APTN News reporter Danielle Perdy. The debate was less than two days before eligible voters of the 60,000 members of the MNA began to cast their ballots. APTN News spoke to Joseph Pimlot days before voting began and asked what makes him ready for the job of president. I've been involved with the Métis Nation for approximately 15 years in some capacity. From a local, regional and provincial level, I've held titles like Local 87 President, Regional Vice President and Provincial Vice President. When asked what makes him stand out from his opponent, he says his experience is a difference maker. I think my years of, uh, of service to our community, I think that's really what, uh, what really makes me stand out when it comes to who the people need to uh, vote for this, this time around. You know, I think that this is a precedent setting event. And then when they're looking for somebody uh, to vote for, they need to vote for experience. He told APTN that basic affordability challenges need to be addressed. I think a number of, uh, number of my top priorities would be health supports. You know, uh, everything is getting so much more expensive. You know, from our young adults to our seniors, they just can't afford uh, those key elements such as prescriptions and food. There's a job and food security that we need to really focus on. And of Pimlot criticized strong, outgoing President know. Audrey Portra for endorsing so Andrea Sandmeyer for, for president. Year. I think every citizen is entitled to support who they want to support. Uh, however, as our president, I believe that uh, she should be unbiased and she has endorsed and openly campaigned my opponent. And I believe that our citizens just want a free and fair election. APTN asked, what would he say to people on the fence on who to vote for? This is definitely a time within our people that we really need to be observant of who is going to be leading us in the future doing our research, doing our due diligence, and making sure that we're asking the right questions. So I would very, very much encourage those folks to contact me if they're on the fence, and please reach out. I was in the APTN will be hearing from the other candidate for president, Andrea Sandmeyer, in the coming days. MNA members have until September 19th at 8 p.m. to cast their ballots. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Edmonton. The annual Healing Our Spirit Worldwide Conference is currently underway in Vancouver. APTN's Tina House was there and has this report. How can you have a treaty unless you tell the truth? An estimated 3,400 delegates from around the world have descended upon Vancouver. And out here on the terrace of the convention centre, people lined up to be smudged. From as far away as Australia, Tahiti, to New Zealand and Mexico, Indigenous healers, community members, and those that work in the health field are here to talk about healing the nations. Jenny Toria is a master healer from Tahiti. She comes from a long line of healers and is the first in her country to now work alongside doctors in the hospitals. This is a big, big opportunity for all the healers, all, all the person who have the love on the heart and the soul to come here to exchange to, to appreciate everything from everyone. <laughs> how did you learn how to heal? Were you born with it? How did you learn? Ah, uh, in, in my, in my genealogy, we, we don't learn, nobody teach, uh, teach us how to be a healer or how to be that, that or that. You was choice before in the, belly. On, in the belly of your mom before you was born. As we were just finishing the interview with Jenny, we witnessed firsthand her healing abilities after she met Chief Ralph Leon of the Chehalis First Nation. He is a residential school survivor who still carries a lot of hurt from the trauma he endured. We asked Chief Leon how he felt after the session. I did have, have a little bit of ailment in my back. You know, thinking, thinking, thinking. You know, thinking can get you sick. 
and um, I feel better, feel good. And, and I just thought of my grandma and then she brought up my grandma like, holy smokes, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's a good thing. And like Jenny, we met Major Sumner, an elder from Australia, who showcases the 18 clans from his tribe in Australia painted on his body. All indigenous people from around the world, they got the stories of the land. They know the stories of how the creation, some of us go right back even before the Ice Age. We was here, we was walking around, we were traveling from different lands before water come up and, and stopped and blocked it. So all the stories that we, we know, that we've got, we need to tell them to the rest of the world. And for Sumner and his delegation from Australia, that storytelling is done through dance. Leah Ballantyne and her community members from Saskatchewan say this conference has been life-changing. Healing our spirits worldwide is so exciting. I wanted to share the experience with some of my community members here. They say the opportunity to see so many other cultures has inspired them. I thought about our culture, like Cree, how I lost my language and that I need to re, you know, get in touch with myself. And that's how I feel. I feel I, like happy, excited. The ninth annual Healing Our Spirit Worldwide concludes this week. Tina House, APTN National News, Vancouver. We have to take another short break, but coming up, a new show on APTN features art and traditional teachings. These things we're, we're doing for the show are based on some of the seven sacred grandfather teachings. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. Today's photo of the day comes from Matthew Louie. Matthew shared this picture near Mount Prevo in British Columbia while enjoying a cup of coffee. 
If you want to be featured as our photo of the day, email your pictures to share at aptn.ca. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Heading over to the East Coast, St. John's 22 tomorrow, Fredericton 17. Northern Quebec, 17 at La Grande River, and in Newfoundland, Labrador, Nain is 17. Settile 20 and in Montreal, 21. In Ontario, a fairly mild day, North Bay, Toronto, London, Sarnia, all 21. Northern Ontario, Wawa 19, and Big Trout Lake, 17. In Northern Manitoba, a little cooler. Puckatawagan and Thompson, 12, the Paw, 19. Southern Manitoba, Dauphin, 21, and Gimli, 18. Southern Saskatchewan, North Battleford, 23 tomorrow, and Swift Current, 24. To the north, Uranium City, 19, Buffalo Narrows, and Meadow Lake, 20. A fairly mild day in Northern Alberta, high level, 21, Grand Prairie and Fort McMurray, 23. Further south, Edmonton, Calgary, 24. Southern BC, Kamloops, 29, Bella Coola, 19. Heading north, Deese Lake, 12, and Smithers, 16. We're looking at 12 at Old Crow and Whitehorse, 14. Northwest Territories, Norman Wells, 18, Fort Simpson, 19. And heading north, Inuvik, 13, and Fort McPherson, 15 tomorrow. Cambridge Bay, 7, Baker Lake, and Chesterfield, 8. In Nunavut, we're looking at Arctic Bay at 2 tomorrow, and Clyde River and Pangertung, 3. In Saskatoon, the Saskatchewan Indian Gaming Authority helped raise money for the White Buffalo Youth Lodge by serving up a pancake breakfast for the community. The White Buffalo Youth Lodge has been serving Saskatoon's inner city since 2000 with programming for the whole family, including gym use and cultural programs. SEGA's fifth annual pancake breakfast took place at the lodge and served 780 people. The mayor of Saskatoon and city police officers, as well as firefighters, joined the chief of the Saskatoon Tribal Council and Gaming Authority staff to serve up the flapjacks. SEGA's Vice President Pat Cook says they raised $28,000 for the Lodge's Youth Council program. And uh, one of the reasons why it's so important that we support organizations like the White Buffalo Youth Lodge is, is the work that they do in our community. You know, they provide support to families, to children, youth, elders, and uh, the programming that they, that they do is so critical to the youth in, in our communities. A new children's show just wrapped up production and will be coming to APTN next year. Sav Jonesa met with the host to see what kids and adults alike can look forward to. An artist from Big Stone Cree Nation in Alberta is making his television debut with a fun kids show about art, crafts and Indigenous teachings. Indigenous Art Adventures with Lance Cardinal is going to be a super exciting cultural adventure of art, uh, song, drumming, language, culture and of course children interaction. It's going to be a fun, fun adventure. Indigenous Art Adventures with Lance Cardinal started out as a YouTube series. It quickly caught the attention of APTN. Cardinal says he focuses on developing kids' creativity. I feel like through art, kids can express themselves in different ways, through feelings, through color, through their physical touch, and kids all learn differently. And I think it's important for us to try to find ways for kids to feel good, not only through success in sports or academics, but also creativity. Themes that are Viewers popular. will learn how to make dream catchers, so rattles, right? and puppets it's of jingle dress oh, dancers. My goodness, my favorite one. But most importantly, mm -hmm. they'll learn about culture. I do love that. These things we're, we're doing for the show are based on some of the seven sacred grandfather teachings. Uh, we, of course, we're talking about uh, protocol, ceremony. We're talking about how to smudge, showing the kids exactly what it means, how to do it, you know, how to actually perform Form a smudge. So we're really taking, you know, what we know as Indigenous people and creating a teaching and then based on that teaching we'll do a craft. So people can use it's a passion day, right? project so, for Cardinal. Yeah. He Love grew that. up finding refuge mm -hmm. in children's shows like Mr. Dress Up and says now his journey has come full circle. 
Growing up as a young uh, two-spirit boy in my community, there was not a lot of people for me to look up to, no one to uh, sort of have as a mentor in my life. So for me, uh, these children's television hosts became the people in my life that influenced me, who told me that I was good enough, that I was important, that what I did was okay, and I really valued that part of my growing up as a kid. And I wanted to do that now as an adult to, to make sure that kids now felt the same way. The show is slated to premiere next spring on APTN and APTN Lumi. Sav Jonza, APTN National News, Winnipeg. Looking forward to tuning into that. Thanks for joining us tonight. If you want to see more of the stories you just saw or would like to see even more, head over to aptnnews.ca. Have a good evening.